I'm President Prophet Terry Patience, and you are listening to Gospel Tangents. It's the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to have another prophet on the show. Terry Patience is the President Prophet of the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, based in Independence, Missouri. You may remember about seven years ago, we had one of uh, the remnant counselors, Jim Van Cannon, on the show. Jim and Terry split during a secession crisis, and so Jim is no longer a member of the remnant church, and Terry is the new prophet. So we're going to dive into what it's like to have a schism on Facebook, which is where some of those conversations led. You won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I can't tell you how excited I am. It's not often that we get to talk to a prophet uh, here on Gospel Tangents, but I walked into the, I literally walked into the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I met a prophet. So could you tell us who you are and where we are? I'm Terry Patience. We are in the headquarters building of the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints here in Independence, Missouri. Perfect. We're literally right across the street from the Community of Christ Temple mm-hmm. and just around the corner from the Temple Lot Church. Correct. And so uh, this is this is fantastic. This is kind of a historic church spot right here. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'd like, we have Temple Square in Salt Lake City. Mm-hmm. This isn't exactly a square. It's more like a trapezoid. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. I think that's, uh, I don't remember what the street boundaries actually are, but if you look at the plot map that Joseph had <clears throat> for his original 12 buildings here in Independence, um, yeah, there was kind of a angle because Lexington over here veers off to the southwest. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's a trapezoid. So we're on Temple Trapezoid. There you go. <laughs> Good description. So it's fun. And plus, the, the LDS Visitor Center is just on the other side of the temple. Yeah, there, that's about a block, block and a half from here south yeah. of this building. We are kind of east of the Community of Christ Temple and the Auditorium and the Stone Church. So we're right. just all adjacent to the original Temple Square that Joseph dedicated back 1800s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. I think it was 1832, but something like that. Cool. Well, let's learn a little bit more about your background. You you actually grew up in the RLDS church, is that right? That's right. I was born in southwest Iowa. Okay. Um, my parents were reorganized Latter-day Saints, so that's where I attended church. was baptized at the age of eight in the reorganized church in Shenandoah, Iowa. And uh, when I was a junior in high school, they moved to Omaha, Nebraska, which is where I met my wife. Uh, she lived across the river in Council Bluffs, Canesville, mm-hmm. that area, uh, with it. A lot of Mormon history there. A lot of Mormon history. We could see the uh, Canesville Tabernacle, the log building. I don't know whether you've been up there well, or not. I haven't been there. I should go. Yeah, up in Council Bluffs, right in the downtown area right there. The, How far is that from Nauvoo, would you say? Probably about four and a half hours because you'd have to go oh, that far away. You'd have to go straight north, quite a little bit farther than what you want to do to get to Nauvoo. Uh huh. Wow, that's interesting. I guess I can't. Cause I'm, I'm someday. <laughs> I'm going to Nauvoo after this interview, and so I was like, "Well, maybe I can hit that." But that's that sounds. Where are you going cool. after Nauvoo? Well, I'm actually going to go to the Heartland Museum in in Iowa in. Uh, it's right across from the Nauvoo, right across the river from the Nauvoo Temple. Oh, okay. So, so you're uh, still in the eastern part of Iowa. Yeah, 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 yeah. And are you going back home then from there? I'm going to come back through here. I'm hoping to – I've been here for uh, uh, Community of Christ World Conference, and so uh, they're getting a new prophet. Apparently, I don't know if I've you've heard, heard that. I haven't heard who. Uh, and Yeah. No, I, don't I don't think, think anybody, anybody knows, knows yeah. And so um, I was talking to John Hamer, and mm-hmm. he told me he thought – there would probably be an announcement on Friday, so I'm hoping to make oh, it back really? for that. So oh, that'd be, you know, I have to keep my ears open. Uh, the announcement's going to be, what are we going to do over the next two years? Because he's going to retire in two years. Okay. And so... Uh, I heard that they were putting a committee together to try to determine who they might pick to mm-hmm. replace VZ with. Well, and on Friday, there was the John Whitmer meeting here in town, okay. and um, John put forth a proposal that they should... Uh, have a president for six-year terms, essentially. Really? And so um, I don't. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if that's going to go anywhere, but that's that's what he wants to yeah. see happen. So well, that's that's really 
uh, different from what the old RLDS church used to do as far as picking a prophet. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I know it's different from what the Utah Latter-day Saints do because uh-huh. that's always someone out of the corner. Well, and that's 12. what John's presentation was on the on the secession and how how it's supposed to be. Well, <laughs> how is it? Well, we can talk about that. Okay. Um, but uh, how how the LDS church has done secession and how the RLDS church has done secession mm-hmm. and uh, up until the last. 10 or 15 years, probably, yeah. 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 And so it, one of the striking things, in fact, let's go there right now. Um, when when I came in here, uh, you had a picture. I, my camera's in the way, but I'm going to get a picture of those pictures right there. Yeah, sure. Maybe here. You know what? I'm just going to do it Turn right now. Turn the camera around and, for a moment. Um, so you can see here uh, we've got Joseph Smith and then um, Joseph Smith the third. And then we have Frederick, and I can't read that very well, but Frederick was the third prophet. Uh, he's Joseph Smith, the third's son. Correct. Is Frederick. And, and then, then Israel. Israel, who was also Joseph the third's son. Correct. And wasn't Wallace? Now, then you yes, have. Yes, yeah, W. Wallace. On your picture there, I need to zoom in a little bit because I know that's a little hard to see. Um, then you have Frederick Nielsen. So there's a big gap between. Um, is that Israel and Frederick Larson? When Israel was he the one that died in a car accident? I believe he was. Israel did. Right? He was on his way to a, a reunion, which is for the reorganized church, somewhere along the line. And I don't have a date for you on that. But they started doing what they called family reunions, where different church members from different regions would come and gather together for usually a week's time, and they would. Uh, Worship together and play together and eat together, et cetera, et cetera. We call those reunions. And he was on his way up to a reunion in Lamoni, Iowa, and uh, yeah, was involved in a car accident. It was very early in the morning. It was rainy, as I recall. It was rainy, yeah. And yeah. He, he went off the road or hit a bridge in Barkman or something to that effect. Well, I thought he. I'd have to look that up. Yeah. If I remember right, it seems like Bill Russell said he actually went into oncoming traffic and I thought he hit somebody. Oh, that could be. And he was killed, but the other person. Oh, that could be true too. Yeah. yeah. So I know uh, it was tragic and it was a big event for the church at the time. I was too young. It was the 1950s, if I remember. Does that sound about right? Oh, I think that's approximately maybe. right. Maybe. I'd have to. Our listeners can tell us. More Our, than likely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's too much information. That's why we have computers these days, right? Exactly, we exactly. I guess we could look it up. Yeah. Um, so in the community of Christ, you have, after Israel was, there were two Wallaces. There was Wally, W. Wallace. W. Wallace William and Wallace, Wallace B. And then Wallace Burnell, I think, was his middle name. And he was the prophet when they started ordaining women. Wally B. was, yes, Wally I B. Think. was. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, then, um, and then Grant McMurray... It's impressive, don't you think? It's impressive that I can actually name off. The it is. It's impressive to me. Yeah. Because um, I can't. I don't even know if I could do that with the LDS because yeah. there's too many. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, I have to tell you a funny story. Um, I was I was interviewing a Catholic. She's a scholar of Mormon studies, but she's Catholic, hmm. and she started singing the prophet song to me like she knew it, and I was like, Oh, oh wow! Well, I don't even know that song. We think. And she was surprised, know. and I said that wasn't a popular song when I was in primary. <laughs> <But> <laughs> <laughs> you, you probably had a primary song that listed the prophets, if I remember right. Yeah. So anyway, and then Grant McMurray, and then Steve Izzy, and then who, I think, who knows who's next? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I don't think there was anybody else. I keep thinking there was somebody in between there, but I'm not no, sure no, about that. No, no, I'm pretty sure that's yeah. right. So, um, so your church started in 1999, 2000. Yeah, absolutely. Can talk about that. History goes back a little farther, and I don't know how much the viewers. I guess technically you're the second person we've had from the Remnant Church, but you've had a schism, which we'll, I hope we can talk about. Yeah, okay. <laughs> if you want to With put it that way, yeah. Jim, Jim Van Cannon, he's now leading the Everlasting Church, Church of Jesus yeah. Christ correct. of the Latter Days, I think is what it's called. I think you're correct, yeah. Um, and uh, so I've always I wanted to get both of you on. Jim's been kind of blowing me off. I don't know why, but uh, yeah, we talked about that a little while ago. And uh, Jim and I were very, very dear friends, and he hasn't really communicated that there's a a wall, a coldness, or something there. Kind of hard it's, feelings. Yeah, in the last four years. Yeah. Well, let's let's jump back to ninety nine two thousand. Mm-hmm. Um, Frederick Larson, is that, that's his name. Yeah, Frederick uh, Brother Larson was not really 
coming into the church at that time and saying, hey, look at me, I, I should ought to be the president of the church in 99. That comes two years later. Uh, in 1999, there was a quorum of, or not a quorum, but a council of high priests that gathered together and a council of elders that gathered together. And really, from what I understand, and I'd have to go back and look at the books, but um, really decided that what we have been hoping for since 1984 isn't going to happen. So that, okay, what happened in 1984? Um, during the conference of 1984, the community, well, it wasn't Community of Christ Church, the reorganized church, our heritage church, mm -hmm. uh, brought some doctrines and changes to the church into a um, section of the Doctrine of Covenants. The section was introduced, and there were several new things that were being presented to the church and a lot of the uh, people of the church at that particular time did not appreciate or agree with that particular set of doctors. Very liberal type of doctrine. Mm -hmm. And so there was a big schism, to use that word, that happened in 84, where a lot of the branches, especially here in the independence area, left uh, the reorganized church. When in some cases the men were silenced because they didn't agree with the new philosophies, new theologies. And in 1999, then, some of those high priests and elders got together uh, through several conferences and went through the similar steps that the reorganized church did back in 1860 to establish the church, the reorganized church in 1860, which Joseph III became a part of. Um, they decided that, well, I guess the only thing we can do, we're not going to wait around any longer for the reorganized church, now Community of Christ Church in ninety nine to change its ways or come back to the original doctrines. Therefore, we're going to have to, if we want to start a, you know, make the church correct, start a new church. Uh, not really the word that they wanted to use is say new church, but legally that's what happens. With it. They feel like they're still connected to the 1830 gospel with it. Uh, Frederick Larson didn't come into the picture until about 2001. He was a part of that high priest council that was meeting together for many, many hours and many days and, and months uh, to try to bring forth what do we do, the, the answer to that question. He was there. But in 2001, then he came forth and said, I've received revelation from above, uh, which is now part of our Doctrine and Covenants, that I, I am supposed to take that leadership role of the new remnant church. Okay. Okay. So... He was a direct descendant of He's Joseph a great-great-grandson of Joseph Smith, correct. Okay, great-great-grandson. Through great. his mother. Okay. Matriarchal line. <laughs> and that's why his last name is Larson, basically. Correct, yeah, okay. why it's not a Smith. Right. Um, and I think a lot of the restoration branches in the area would still love to see a Smith come forth that was a direct descendant. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened. Okay. So uh, so how did you get involved in the Remnant Church? My wife and I were, as said earlier, were part of the organized church. And in 92, we decided that the reorganized church, Community of Christ Church at that time, was really going down a path that we didn't really agree with either and left that Community of Christ Church in our local area. <clears throat> Went to our stake president and said, I don't think we can do this anymore. And went down a different path for a while. And in about, I'm going to say 2006 or seven, my wife was upstairs in our study in Council Bluffs and said, Terry, Terry, you got to come up. And I came up and she says, I think I found it again. And she had ran across the Remnant Church website. Oh. And was seeing some of the, the structure was there, the teachings were there, the sermons that were being presented felt very comfortable to us. Now, maybe that's because we were raised in that heritage that those things felt comfortable to us. So that, well, I won't deny that. But anyway, that started our pathway then. We started attending um, a remnant church in Missouri Valley, which was like 20 miles north of Council Bluffs. We came down here one Sunday just on an exploratory visit and visited what is now Zions Hill for a congregation, the main congregation here in Independence. And kind of see if I can find it here, but um, I had a really neat experience 
when we were sitting in the sanctuary. We got there a little bit early with it. And we're, we're contemplating, okay, what do we do? Is this the right place to be? Those kind of questions. And I literally, randomly opened up my, doctor, my Book of Mormon mm-hmm. to what is in the Remnant Church's Book of Mormon, chapter 5 of Alma, starting with verse 32. For I said unto you from the beginning that I had much desire that you were not in a state of dilemma like your brethren. Even so, I have found that my desires have been gratified, for I perceive that you are in the right path of righteousness. I perceive that you are in the path which leads to the kingdom of God. And I read that, and every time I read it still, I feel the spirit confirmation of that. And that was a confirmation to me that the remnant church is where I belong. Mm. And so then we more actively started in uh, attending the remnant church up in What Missouri year was Valley. this approximately? I'm going to say 2007. Okay. Yeah, I think that my wife could probably correct me if that's not right, but that's really close. Okay. Really close to the, so ever since then, we've been a part of the Remnant Church. Um, we decided at some point that we would like to move to Independence. And I had been working in a ophthalmology group in uh, Council Blossom in Omaha for, as one of their managers, not a doctor. And um, Oh, I thought you were an ophthalmologist. No, well, I wish. One of the problems was... I was an optician. Was, oh, optician. Yeah, I think... Um, I think Wallace, W. Wallace was, if yeah. I remember right. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I'd have to look that one up, too. Um, so an optician is not the same thing as an optometrist? That's correct. We're the guys who take care of your eyeglasses and your contact lenses. Okay. And I can't, I happen but to talk... But you still go, can you see this? Oh, yeah, I do do better one. Which one's better? Yeah. <laughs> but the doctor's the one that writes the script and gets the money. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then he pays me. Um Talked to a vendor that I had here in Kansas City area, and I said, Larry, he says, someday I'd, you know, we'd like to move to Independence, and if you ever happen to hear about a position down there that I might be suited for, let me know. And it took him a couple of years, but he finally did come to me. I said, I think I got something that'll work for you. Came down, interviewed, and we moved in a few weeks. Oh, wow. After that, yeah. So that's, that started our path. What year, approximately? 2011, I think. Okay. I think it was like 10 years after, when was 9-11? 2001. Yeah, it was 10 years after that, so that. Okay. 2011, yeah. So we ended up moving then to Independence. So in September? <laughs> no, we moved about a week before General Conference, so we moved at the end of March. Okay. And we're here in time for the April General Conference of the Remnant Church. Okay. I was called to be in the Quorum of Twelve. Shortly after that, they had appointed me or given me a calling to be the missionary and training director for the church, uh, which obviously is kind of like training the missionaries who go out. That was my job for a while. So did you go out two by two like that? No, no? I, we just never had the manpower <laughs> and the funds mm-hmm. to be able to do that. But I did have basically teenagers that would sit in my class and we'd meet and we'd talk about the things you need to know, be a missionary and go out. Uh, so that's what I was doing when they called me into the Quorum of Twelve. I spent quite a bit of time there, several years there before they, uh, President Larson, unfortunately passed away, and things. So changed. you were the president of the Quorum of the Twelve, weren't you? No, I, Don Burnett was the president of the Quorum of Twelve. Oh, I at thought that you time. were. No. Oh. No, nope, sorry. Okay. No, just one of the workers. See, I was bees. looking. <laughs> I have to tell you, um, after after my interview with Jim, I, I have a few remnant friends, and mm. um, so it, it appeared to be. I th- so I thought you were Brigham Young, and I thought Jim and Cannon was Sidney Rigdon. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> didn't work out that way. It didn't work out that way. Okay, yeah. And so, because uh, isn't there somewhere in the Doctrine and Covenants? I don't, I don't know exactly, but. It says that Joseph, if he falls into sin, he can appoint a new person in his stead. Is yeah, and that's one of the things I was looking up while you were looking at the pictures. Oh, here. okay. It's I think here in our section forty-two or forty-three. Let me see if I can find it. It's section forty-three. See, and in section forty-three, verse our paragraph two, that be it's forty-three in the LDS one two. But okay, verily, so verily, same. yeah, same here at this point. Verily, verily, I say unto you that none else shall be appointed 
unto this gift, the gift being that of uh, designating the successor, except it be through him, the him being the current uh, prophet president of the church. For if it be taken from him, he shall not have power except to appoint another in his stead. And this shall be the law unto you, that you receive not the teaching of any that shall come before you as revelation or commandments. And this I give unto you, that you may not be deceived, that you may know they are not of me. So this is uh, one of the strong bases for the remnant church and the old uh, heritage mother church, we call it either way, um, for the designation of the prophet that follows whoever. So in the case of um, Joseph the Third, he had already designated by letter uh, his successor, and there was some concern about it with Israel because I'm not sure they were either not able to find the letter or the letter really didn't exist, but they went to a council, and the council said, yes, by all means, it should be him. He's the one that's been trained for the job, Israel. So Israel then took on that role with it. And that's been the case uh, down through the ages, and we followed that that pattern, that uh, whoever was, even though he be, as you say, in discretion at some point, uh, he still has that one last gift to determine who should be the next prophet president of the church. Okay. So pretty much the RLDS prophets would appoint usually their son until, uh, well, I guess Wallace B. appointed Grand McMurray, who was not a Smith descendant. Correct. Um, I mean, the interesting thing— Here again, uh, Wally B. didn't have any sons that were either— qualified or ready to take on that leadership role. Well, and I even heard that W. Wallace, his father, mm-hmm. um, he picked Wallace B., but Wallace B. was like, I'm, I don't, I'm, not, I'm an eye doctor. I'm not a prophet. Yeah. I, need, I need two years to prepare. Yeah, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> and so, uh, so it took, so there was kind of a two-year transition Um because I so I guess Wallace continued to be the prophet until he appointed Wallace B, and then he kind of retired. Because previous to that, Joseph Smith III died in office, Fred died in office, Israel died in office. Correct. Wallace W. Wallace was the first one to retire essentially. Correct. Yeah, correct. And then Wallace retired in favor of Grant McMurray. Right. And I, I know this is about the remnant church, but we, it's, it's a big deal in the community of Christ, and it's and it's world conference this week, and um, they're going down a different path. Which well, is, and uh, and McMurray just resigned, and he didn't appoint anyone in his stead, mm-hmm. and so they were like, "Well, who?" And then uh, Steve Vizi somehow somehow I don't know that story or something. So I can't help you. Out. Um, and so now they're trying to say, "Well, what should we do now?" Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So it's interesting that you do go back to that scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants for your succession because right. wasn't Fred Larson picked because he was a Smith descendant? I'm not sure that that's quite the right phrase. Okay. Um, and I'd have to go back to our, the Doctrine and Covenants. There's a section in here where he comes forth and reveals to the council that he is— this, that the Lord wants him to be the successor, that the Lord had Oh, so Fred him. had a revelation, essentially, that he should yes, be the leader? that's correct. Okay. That's correct. And I think the fact that he was a descendant of Joseph certainly aided him in that, uh, call, that calling and that realization, because I've heard that all of the Smith people <laughs> are always somewhat in fear that, oh, my gosh, someday I may be called upon. Uh, oh, and who wouldn't, you know, if your dad or your uncle or whatever was a prophet of a church, a major church, and yeah. yeah. Huh. Was there a angelic visitation or anything, do we know, or was it just For Fred? More, for Fred. Was I don't it just think he's ever or? indicated that there was an angelic visitation. Okay. Because huh. I know the Strangite, because I'm all into restoration history, right. Strangites are like, no, you need an angel to come. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And that's why they mm-hmm. haven't had another prophet since, because... No, no angel, angel has, shown has up. come. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And so that's that. why they don't have a prophet anymore. They're just led by a high priest now. Yeah. Huh. Their 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 apostles all died out and everything as yeah. well. So. No, I don't think so. I don't think Fred ever talked about. It, at least, if he did, he left that in a conversation with his counselors 
somewhere along the line, and I have no privy to that particular bit of information. Okay. So I don't think that's the case. So you were just a <laughs> just regular run-of-the-mill apostle? Yeah, <laughs> not, not the president of, or anything? No, not the president of the quorum. Okay. Fred appointed you to be the, the new prophet, is that it? Yes. Um, while Fred was in his last days, he was unfortunately hospitalized, and he had uh, a visitor, two visitors come to him. Carl Van Cannon came to his room one day, and Kevin Romer, and we talked a little he's bit about He's the presiding Kevin. bishop. He's, he's our presiding bishop. And, and was at that time. Of, this, of Aaron. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Levi. Um, went to Fred's room and said, Fred, this is a concern that we have. And I'm sure there was other things like, how are you and so forth in that hospital room visitation. Did he have a stroke? Do we know? I think that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they went to his room one evening and said, Fred, what do we want to do about this? How do we resolve this? Have you got any insights? And Fred then dictated a letter to Carl and to Kevin indicating what his wishes were. The wishes were that if he didn't pass away, that these things were to happen. If he did pass away, then there was another set of things that were supposed to happen. And that's where my name came into the picture that I was to take over as prophet president of the church in that letter that he dictated. Did I say that right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that he dictated. So he dictated a letter in his he, hospital room. In his hospital room. We have a videotape of that event. Oh, you do? We do. Oh, really? On a thumb drive. Um, Is that something you'd be willing to share? No. Okay. The family doesn't want it shared. Okay. Uh, there was a lot of concern as to whether or not Fred was with it enough, to use a more vernacular term, I guess, yeah. or, you know, uh, able to make that kind of decision. And everybody that has seen that video, and there's been several, um, it's only like two or three minutes long, but uh, has agreed that he appears to be at least very cognizant and very aware of what he is saying, and this is what he meant. Now, Kevin testifies that even prior to him going into the hospital, like for months, uh, Brother Larson really struggled with this decision and he had talked to Kevin a few times and had indicated to Kevin that this was true. So Kevin had a testimony that this is probably what will happen as long, but Fred still has that right, no matter what, to indicate who his successor ought to be. So they dictated, Fred signed it, and we have copies of it. Hmm. I believe, and I know, I'm sure this is a sticky topic here, but this is where Jim Van Cannon, now you also said there was a Carl Van Cannon? Is that what Carl Van saying? Cannon, I think. Van Cannon. Van Cannon. Okay, so he's not related to Jim. Yes, he is. Oh, he is related to Jim. I think Carl is his cousin. I don't think he was an uncle. I think he was just a cousin to okay. Jim. So they're in the same family. Okay. Yeah, fairly close. And so Carl's still a member of your church? No. No, he's joined with Jim? No, he, went, he followed Jim. Oh, so but he was a witness to this letter? That's correct. Oh, well, that's really interesting. That's in the video. Cool. I didn't know His about. signature's on the letter. Wow. And so in the letter, Fred appointed you to be the next prophet and Jim yeah. to be a counselor? That is correct. And Jim, from what I understand, doesn't accept. He thinks there was something fishy going on there. Uh, I would let Jim speak for Jim as to what Jim thinks you know, was going on at that particular I still love and admire Jim a lot. I think he's a wonderful man. Mm -hmm. um, I did go to Jim and say shortly after I was told, uh, Jim, this is what I understand Fred wanted. Are you willing to be my counselor? And he said no. And I'll let him explain that if you ever have an opportunity to talk to him about that <laughs> and see how he wants to say that. Huh. But he said he didn't. He couldn't support that decision. He had, He felt... There was other things that ought to take place. Yeah. From what I understand, it seems like he felt like there was some undue pressure on Fred or something. And Perhaps. Uh, he felt that Fred had for a long time kind of mentored 
Jim to be ready for that position. And that may have played some part in his thinking that he automatically ought to be. Um, I don't know all of the details. Carl supposedly has more details, and he's never shared those with me. Hmm. Um, so I can't get down that path. All I, all I can speak to is what happened to me and and so forth. Okay, okay. I don't want to be unfair <laughs> to a man I love dearly. No, I think that's great. So as we look at the apostles, do you have 12 apostles now, or is it fewer than that? We only have seven. Seven, okay. Um, manpower is a big issue. Uh, there's there's a lot of jobs. <laughs> there's a lot of positions within the church. And un so unfortunately, we don't have any more than seven. We just gained our seventh apostle this last uh, conference that we had in okay. March. And then um, w did a lot of people go away with Jim? Do you have any sense for how many people that was? And how, how large is your church? Our church is about 4,000 plus strong worldwide. Okay. We have, I'm going to say maybe four or 500 here in the metro area of Independence. Okay. We talked earlier about we have two congregations. We have our larger congregation a couple of miles east of here called what we call now Zions Hill. And then we have also our uh, community of houses we call Bountiful which is about 20 miles east of here. That's kind of a Zionic enterprise <laughs> where everybody that's in that 200-acre lot uh, are church members and have consecrated and are a part of the House of Enoch, the Order of Enoch, and we have a church building in that on that property. And the Order of Enoch is your attempt at consecration, is that right? It is a, definitely a part of our consecration. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you guys kind of pool your resources? Not in the sense of all things in common, if that's the question. Yeah. No. It just seems like, I mean, that was the big thing in Kirtland, right? It With was. Joseph, and then yeah. it, it kind of yeah. fizzled out. And right. Uh, Kevin, uh, Brother Romer, has really done a lot of study on that. And one of the problems with having all things in common is it takes away some of the individual's agency. So we have not chosen really to go down that all things in common pathway. So everybody out of Bountiful owns their own house, owns their own property, pays their own taxes, et cetera. But it's still a common effort to try to live together by the values that Christ would want us to live together, um, to be able to help each other in situations and whatever they might be. Uh, we Right now, I think we have 16 or 17 homes that are built on that community. There's still two lots that are available. One of them's under contract at the moment, and that will almost fill up the the lot. We may have to look for another place for a so bountiful you, too. You've got a, like a subdivision of just remnant church members, basically. Yes, that's oh, correct. Wow. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first time I came became acquainted with your church, I ran into Arlo Stevenson, and mm -hmm. of course, he's a member of the House of Aaron, mm -hmm. and they are a Consecration Society out yep. here. In oh, they're Pascoe they're really all things in common, or at least used to be. Arlo says they've kind of gotten away from that in the last few years. Yeah, it sounds a little bit more <laughs> like yours, yeah. but yeah. I can see there there seems to be a synergy between your two churches. I I can see. Yeah, we've been we've been communicating quite a bit with the House of Aaron. Uh, you know, they claim to be of the tribe of Levi, and we're more of the tribe of Ephraim. We do have some Leites. Did I say that right? Le Levites. Levites. Levites in the church that have been identified by patriarchal blessing as that or by me. So it's more than just Kevin Romer? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but most of us are of the tribe of Ephraim. So we, you know, if, if we're the tribe of Ephraim, and we think most of the people in the United States probably are because they're part of the tribe of Joseph, uh, Book of Mormon Joseph. Uh, and then we've got the Levites that are out there at Exdale. You know, how do we view each other? How do we share back and forth? How do we communicate? What is, what is the purpose of Levites in the modern day society? What is the purpose of Ephraim in the modern day society? And how do we work together? And what authority do we recognize from one place to another? Always an issue with a lot of things. But so we're still communicating on that. Um, 
I've talked with John Conrad, the head of uh, Exdale, a few times. Been out there twice. I love the man. Yeah, dear Good man. Um, very intelligent man. Love to sit down and talk with him. He's neat. Yeah, he's a fun guy. He's a fun guy. In the LDS Church, uh, a lot of the Native Americans, when they receive their patriarchal blessings, mm-hmm. are from the tribe of Manasseh. Okay. Is that is that the same with your church or no? I don't know of any. I'm trying to think if we have any Native Americans that we know of that have enough Native American blood in them, you know, to say I'm half Lamanite. Chippewa or whatever it might be. <laughs> With that, we do have a church down in Black Gum, Oklahoma, which is really in Indian territory with it. And I don't know that any, and that's why I was hesitating a minute, uh, I don't know how many, if any, of the members of that branch might be Indian. But I don't know that they've had patriarchal blessings. I'm not privy to everybody's patriarchal blessing and or what tribe they might have been uh, identified as being with Manasseh. So anything I might know might be just hearsay. Okay. Um, it's funny because I just interviewed, uh, Deb Luce. She's a evangelist for the community mm-hmm. of Christ. I asked her, um, about the, the tribe designation and it sounds like they don't really do it much anymore. At one time I know, uh, when we were still there, we, my wife and I were still there, they started getting away from identifying what tribe you might be a part of mm-hmm. in the patriarchal blessings. So there's a lot of people in the reorganized or now community of Christ Church who never had that designation made for some reason. So I think that's a good observation. They've gotten away from it for some reason. And so that sounds like it's still a pretty big part of, of your church as well. I think it's something we need to ask ourselves. What does God mean by that? What is the role that ought to be played if we are going to all at some point, and I do mean all, gather together in a Zionic uh, community, God's kingdom here upon the face of the earth. And we know that there are tribes. What does that mean? Is there a different role for Levi who is not supposed to own property according to the Old Testament? They are supposed to be the caretakers of the other tribes. Well, is that still the case that Levi needs to be the caretaker? What is the perspective that Levi might have because of that designation? Um if a Levite doesn't own property, he's supposed to help take care of me and you. How does that change his thinking about you and I and what he's doing and stuff? And I think there's some very important things that need to be answered there, and I don't know that we have those answers yet. Hmm. Very interesting. Are you aware of uh, any other tribes like Judah or Dan or any of the other tribes being designated in patriarchal blessings in your church? I think there's a few Danites. Other than that, I don't know. Like I said, not I Danites in the Nauvoo sense. No, no, not <laughs> not, not, not Danites in that sense. But people who are the house of Dan, right? Seemed like somebody told me once they were the house of uh, Naphtali, but I couldn't oh. tell you who that was or how many years ago that was. But okay. So again, I don't have privy of that that database. That's a bishopric thing. No, no, that's cool. Uh, so the presiding bishop, Rick, is, are they in charge of patriarchal blessings? Our patriarchs are in charge of the blessings. Okay. But I think it's probably the bishop, Rick, that files them away and knows oh. where the file has the key to the file. They know where they are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know typically, well, I shouldn't say typically because it's different, um, but quite often in the LDS church, uh, a lot of, especially missionaries, a lot of times when they're teenagers, mm-hmm. They be they they we receive our patriarchal blessings. Okay, is it similar in your church, or does it age matter? Age doesn't really matter, and I don't know that we've ever said, you know, oh yeah, you're 16 years old, you ought to think about getting your patriarchal blessing. Or, um, I think we encourage that. Maybe 16 might be a little bit young for some, might be too old for others, depending upon where they're at maturely. Um, so whenever they're ready. You know, we would suggest that they visit the patriarchs and allow the patriarchs to present their patriarchal blessing. For some people who join the church more in later years in their life, obviously that's not going to be the case. Same same in our church. Yeah. I think uh, if I look at my patriarchal blessing, it gave me some guidance and some direction as to maybe what my gifts might be or what I should be seeking out within my lifetime where I would be the most comfortable. Hmm. Yeah. 
Very good. I know talking to Deb, um, she said they don't limit it to just one. One and tribe or one? One patriarchal, patriarchal blessing. Blood. Really? Um, that, you know, let's say a spouse passes away, maybe you'd like another hmm. one or something, which I think is kind of cool. Um, maybe a different perspective on what the patriarchal blessing is. Okay. I'm just guessing because I can't, again, speak for them. That's information I was unaware of. Oh, yeah. Uh, so but typically it's just one patriarchal blessing in uh, the church? That would be right, yeah. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, very cool. It, it's funny how these things, it, it, like I, I just love comparing <laughs> among the different that's, churches. That's fine. Um, tell us more about your church. I, I know consecration, we've kind of talked a little bit about that. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a big deal. Um, and... You're fairly familiar with both the RLDS Church and the LDS Church. That is true. What would you? What are some of the biggest differences you can see with either either church? Uh, with your church, our temple is different. Um, just looking at the Kirtland Temple okay. as being an example. Okay. Um, we don't have the endowment rooms going from celestial, terrestrial, celestial, celestial. You know, we don't have that. We don't have the handshakes. We don't have the the names that are given that are supposed to be, at least in the LDS heritage from my understanding, uh, to say these are the keys that you need to get into the celestial kingdom at some point. Especially currently as we are looking at what do we think a temple ought to be, and we would look more at the early Nauvoo and especially the Kirtland Temple, you know, what was going on there. I don't, from the studies that I've done and from what I've heard, um, the original Nauvoo Temple was patterned very much like the Kirtland Temple. It did not have the endowment rooms and the ceiling rooms in Mm -hmm. it, okay? That came later as the LDS Church was trying to build the Nauvoo Temple, the current one that's there. Mm-hmm. They started looking at, well, this is our current temple structure and format and activity level. Therefore, we need to put these rooms into that temple. Now, there is a um, uh, a room for the a congregation to get a sanctuary mm-hmm. for a congregation to gather, and there are pulpits on both ends right. of in the Nauvoo Temple. It's not something that everybody who visits the Nauvoo Temple sees because they usually just go do the endowments. <laughs> yeah. Same absolutely. thing's true with the Salt Lake Temple. There is that sanctuary in the Salt Lake Temple, but that's not normally where you go. You go do your endowments mm-hmm. with it. So we're looking at in a temple being more, and the phrase that I've recently ran across by one of our early writers was, that our modern day temple ought to be a temple, especially in the remnant church. And this is a reorganized writer. In the modern day Remnant Temple ought to be for the, I'm trying to make sure I use the right word, benefit, and that's not the word he used, but the benefit of those who are living rather than worrying about what's going to happen after death. So we see, and I gave you a tour of it a little while ago. I know, I was really our new, A brand new holy sanctuary upstairs. Uh, it's, it's just barely four weeks from dedication. Oh, is it that new? Yes, yeah, March 26th, the plaque behind me. Oh, wow. Yeah. March 26th, we, zoom in on that yeah, we dedicated it on that particular day. We will use that holy sanctuary as a place for the School of the Prophets. I really felt like there needs to be this special sanctuary for the School of the Prophets. And the reason for the School of the Prophets is to train our leadership, to train our men so that they somehow or another— through their, the work that is going on within them, the training and the intellectual research and so forth, become prepared and, if you would, endowed with the abilities that they need so that they can go out to the world and do what God wants them to do. So it's not, a, it's not going through an, uh, an endowment session from room to room. It's going to be a, a lot of time spent in this holy sanctuary where the Spirit can teach us and the Scriptures can teach us and the Prophet can teach us what we need to know to become an endowed people as we go out into the world and spread the gospel. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. You know, it was funny because um, 
somebody had alerted me Friday night. There was a John Whitmer business meeting, and somebody had said, have you seen the temple in the Remton Church? And I said, no. He said, do you remember how it was under construction in September? And I said, yes. <laughs> he said, they've got a temple in there. But, so do you, do you refer to that room as kind of the temple? Because it's just kind of a room here. We're yeah. we're in the old Crispin High School. It's right. kind of the headquarters. Right. But you've got a room here that's kind of Kirtland style. I know you said there were some issues with the building and you couldn't put the pulpits at both ends yeah. for capacity reasons and things like that. Right. But, but the idea is it, it is a temple? We haven't... And I don't think the Lord has, to me, revealed that we ought to term that yet as a temple. Even to term it as a house of the Lord, to me, means Christ has been here. You know, the okay. Kirtland Temple, he was there. Mm-hmm. He visited that spot shortly after well, dedication. And I can even see, I know behind Oh, yeah, you, right behind me. Yeah, you, I'm going to zoom in on that picture there. I, that is one of my favorite pieces of art. Oh, I'm out of focus. I'm trying to get that into focus. It doesn't want to focus. A little editing. Can I bring the picture to you? There you go. <laughs> and because uh, I just love this. I don't know. My painting. hands are pretty shaky, so I hope that. Um, maybe I should zoom out a little bit. Um, uh, that's that's um, Jesus uh, with uh, Joseph and Oliver, I believe. Yeah, Christ and, appears uh, in the Kirtland Temple by Walter Rose. I just love that. That painting, I think it's awesome. Yeah. Um, and he's standing there on the pulpits in the in the Kirtland Temple. Yeah. There, and the the veil is drawn there. Uh, one of my favorite paintings um, ever. And so you, and until something like ha- that happens, you wouldn't call, refer to this as as a temple. Is that is that what you're right? Saying? And you know, like we were talking upstairs when we were there. I sense that the Lord sees it being more than just one room, a temple being more than just one room. Mm-hmm. Um, if we look at the plots of New Jerusalem independence back when Joseph was alive, Joseph Jr., you know, there was 24 buildings. There was a building for the elders. There was a building for this, and there was a building for the high priest yeah. and apostles in the 70s. And, you know, they all had their own spot along with – a building or two for the bishops and the needs that the bishops could distribute goods to the people and the needy and so forth with that. Uh, As I have wandered around this building, and I've had my office here in this building now for probably close to 10 years, I was wandering around this building before I was in the seat that I am now and felt like, you know, this whole building could be a temple. It could be a complex of rooms set apart for the 12 and the 70 and the high priests and the elders and the priests and the deacons, teachers and the deacons and the, and the need. And, and it, it already serves that function in some ways. Not only do we now have our holy sanctuary room, but uh, downstairs we serve Lunch Partners Program, which is a program to the needy who are street people. Every and Monday and Wednesday Monday, Friday, Wednesday and Friday we feed them lunch. We feed them lunch, box lunch, and they also can walk through a little mini grocery store depending upon how much we have been given. And we give a lot of people. The local grocery stores will contribute and say, well, you know, oh, come nice. pick up a truckload of bread or, you know, that kind of thing. So we'll the put House that on Aaron's the shelves. is involved in that as well? I th- uh, or are they? I Julie they and Arlo to. were for a long time, but they've since stepped away just because Arlo's health is – Oh. Weakening, and he said, "You know, that's a bit of a stress." So, I okay. Think, anyway, that was that's happened was probably in the last year. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry um, to hear about Arlo. Yeah, I mean, he's in good health. If you were to see him today, you wouldn't know anything. Yeah, but, you know, it's kind of the way he felt about it. So we do lunch partners. We do the clothes closet. Those are services to those who are in need within the community. We have our headquarters here, our office building, the bishopric, the presidency, and so forth. It's all here. Um. We now have the Holy Sanctuary, and we could certainly we have a conference room, and so forth here in this this, this facility. And so um, we talked a little bit about your general conference. I know, mm-hmm. just for you know, LDS we have it every six months. Mm-hmm. Community of Christ has it every three years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you do it every year, is that right? Um. Yeah, I think more recently in the last 10 years, we've probably had a conference every year. Okay. Um, Sometimes we've tried to scale it back. Instead of calling it a general conference, 
we call it a men's retreat and women's retreat. But we found out last March, hmm, there's enough business things going on, enough ordinations that need to take place that we're going to have to have a business session during that retreat. So the difference between a retreat and a conference is pretty slim. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, every year we try to do at least one or the other. And is that a worldwide thing where you try to bring in everybody? It's very difficult for our saints in uh, Kenya or Uganda, uh, Nigeria, India to make the trip back. Sometimes we will uh, pay for some of the men in India or the men in Africa to come back for that, maybe one or two of the main leadership every year. It's a lot less expensive for us to send somebody over there to spend six weeks or so. And we just had that happen here recently Uh, to go over there and try to teach them and work with them and and minister to them rather than trying to bring all of them back here. I'd love it. I think it'd be awesome if we could bring. But, you know, you get into 1,000 to 1,500 saints from overseas. Yeah, uh, That's a huge expense. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, and you said it. Um, your conferences are much more like Community of Christ than LDS. Our conferences, a daily schedule would be something like coming to the conference at 8.30 in the morning for a prayer service, prayer and testimony service, and that usually lasts an hour and a half or so. Um, sometimes we will have a presentation on a subject matter. Maybe I might speak on eschatology or somebody else might speak on marriage counseling or any type of topic like that that we felt like the church needed. And that's usually just a presentation, hopefully then some give and take conversation between the people and the, and the audience. Then there's also going to be some kind of a business session where you would actually do the business of the conference. Uh, do we want to print a new Doctrine and Covenants and the expense involved in that? Or do we, these men are being called to these different new quorums and we have to approve that by general conference body? with it. Uh, Of course, approving the budgets for the church, those kind of things that would be done during those business sessions. And then in the evening is usually a preaching service. And then the next day you do it all over again. And the next day you do it all over again. (laughs) Pretty soon you're done. You know, and Sunday morning you have a general worship and everybody goes home. Well, and I know it's been really interesting (laughs) attending a world conference with the community of Christ. Oh, yeah. um, Because they have these resolutions uh, like the one that's been going on for two days now <laughs> yeah, uh, is on whether, well, the resolution basically is they want, you know, there's a lot of Catholics that were baptized as mm-hmm. infants, especially in Europe. I think it's a bigger issue there than probably in the mm-hmm. United States um, that want the community of Christ to recognize to recognize that bapti- that infant yeah. baptism. That's what I've heard. And they've always said, no, you got to be at least eight Correct. You know, they'll recognize a bapti- an LDS baptism or a Methodist baptism as long as the person was Accountable. over age, age eight. Um, and so the resolution is just to say, well, you, will, you re- will you at least consider this? But it's been shocking to me about, well, we need to add this phrase. We don't – we need to take mm-hmm. this phrase out. Add this word. Take that word out. And it's just like – don't you have the idea down? Like, do we need to, And it's really like the yeah. chair recognizes uh, yeah. pulpit three. And, it's you know, Robert's Rules and Order <laughs> to the they've extreme. Got a, they've got a time limit of five minutes and, you know, yeah. you're out of time or yeah. – I mean, most people finish early. Yeah. But it, it's just like they really get into the, the minutiae and it's like, don't you understand the point? Like, do we need to spend two days <laughs> trying to just work out the language yeah. on first presidency? Would you think about this? Yeah, I get it. <laughs> Um, that, so that's it's been not true. quite that detailed as in yours? We still have conference resolutions. Okay. Um, usually not very many, maybe one or two on specific things, because we, we don't want to over-legislate the church either. I think they like to over-legislate. I think they say, uh, having grown up there, I, told, I remember one argument over what color the roof ought to be in the church building we were in. I mean, it was a heated argument, whether it would be brown or green. Yeah, that was a long time ago. But, yeah, so we do still have conference resolutions. If there's something that would be a law that might need to be binding to the entire church, then, yes, we would have those discussions. Fortunately for me, because <laughs> I would be the chair, we don't have to. We don't usually have to go through all of those amendments to the amendment to the amendment to the amendment stuff. 
And then you got to backtrack back through it until you finally get down to the uh, a resolution as amended. Right. And then you vote on it. But sometimes we do have like maybe one or two amendments. You know, maybe it'd be better if we worded it this way than rather than that way. You know, well, let's vote on it. Does everybody agree? Yeah, everybody agrees. <laughs> And that's something you wouldn't see in the LDS church? No, not at all. No. Not yeah. at all. It's very yeah. top down. And yeah. I mean, it is interesting to see. I mean, they have some resolutions on like it, like supporting the Palestinians as well as the Israelis in Israel. Sure. And I, w- I was talking to a conference member and he said, at this rate, we're never going to get to that resolution because it's, <laughs> it's, you know. It's if, way down the list. It's way down the list. And um so it, it's kind of interesting because it, it seems like the activists are the ones who attend these things. You know, not, not everybody can vote. They True. have delegates. True. Do you have delegates in yours no. as well? So far, we're a small enough church that we allow the entire church to be able to vote. Okay, okay. But yeah, um, and I remember as a child when I was in the reorganized church that in our stake conferences that we would hold prior to a general conference that we would vote on who's going to be a delegate. You have a church of 250,000 people when I was in my teens. That's about the size of the organized church at that time. And we were a part of the Omaha Council of Stake, and we had two or 3,000 members just in the Omaha Council of area, which to an LDS church, that doesn't sound like much, but to our LDS church, that's huge. So you can't invite everybody to come down and expect them to be able to vote. Uh, logistically, that's difficult. So, yeah, I remember those days when they would try to nominate, well, we think so-and-so ought to go because, and they would become delegates. Hmm. Yeah, so that's very interesting um, just to see those differences. Um, it's more of a, they call it a theocratic democracy. <laughs> Theo-democracy? Theocratic democracy. <laughs> Technically, they do, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's because they do get into that democratic process. Right, right. Yeah, it's very parliamentary. That's I, don't, sure. I don't know how often some of those resolutions might revolve around actual doctrines of the church. But personally, I think changing the, day, uh, the age of a person being baptized and what you accept and who can baptize them is a doctrinal issue. Well, yeah, definitely. I would say so. Um, I won't voice an opinion on what they're doing. (laughs) I have too many friends there. (laughs) Cousins and aunts and uncles. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Terry Patient, President Prophet of the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In our next conversation, I'm going to hit him with some of the hot bushing issues, LGBT, polygamy, and even women in priesthood. All of the conversations that I've ever had would make it difficult for me to change my perspective on women being ordained. One of the things that really bothers me is that if I am a male elder and I'm called to go out frequently with a female elder, as a human being, can I control myself? If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, you can hear the audio only at patreon.com slash gospel tangents. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview with no interruptions. If you want to watch the entire video for just $8 a month, you can also sign up at Patreon or on youtube.com slash gospel tangents and just subscribe here. You can watch the entire video uncut before everybody else. Also, if you'd like to continue to support Gospel Tangents, you can either sign up for our $10 or $20 memberships, or you can get some cool gear like this hat. Um, I've got the coffee mugs like this here. Uh, We've got sweatshirts and t-shirts, and I'm even thinking about ties. Somebody said they wanted a tie, so I'll see if I can get that on my store. So go to gospeltangents.com store, and you can get some Gospel Tangents gear. So you don't want to miss that. So anyway, thanks for listening. If you'd like to check out some of our other videos, check out here.